Hello, friends. Welcome to another Tech Talk. Today, we have the opportunity to talk with a person who has a very unique skill set. He's a Quarkus expert and also a Spring expert. So I'd like to, to invite you to the, to the stage. Eric, welcome, Eric. Hey, thanks, Edson. It's good to be here. Yeah. Yeah, and I can see that, yes, we have this very interesting subject today, Quarkus for Spring Developers, and it seems that you wrote something about it, uh, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I did. I spent pretty much this entire year since January uh, writing this this book that we that we recently published, you know, taking a look at Quarkus from the, kind of looking at, at it through the lens of a someone who's familiar with Spring and you know, the Spring concepts and conventions and whatnot. Um, and kind of comparing and contrasting with with Quarkus. Cool. Well, we can't wait to hear more about it. So uh, we'd like to say that today, live from New Hampshire and Cary, North Carolina, welcome to Dev Nation. Awesome. Thank you. It's great to be here. And I'll apologize up front for my kind of jerry-rigged background here. I couldn't figure out how to get a nice... A virtual background that didn't make me look like I didn't have any ears. So, you know, apologies. I, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is at this point. So people were probably more interested in looking at the, the big thing on the screen rather than this little, little box here on the side. Right. So like Edson said, we, you know, when I first started off in, in a little bit about my background, I, you know, before joining Red Hat, I have a, a huge amount of experience in spring. I worked for a lot of financial services companies where that standardized on spring and I kind of unique for me is I skipped the whole Java EE thing. I went right from you know thick client desktop using Swing with you know maybe a little bit of like servlet based backend to Spring, and I you know I skipped Java EE and all that kind of stuff. So for me, when I when this when Corcus first came out, it was like okay, how how do I learn this? And like anything that anybody's familiar with, you know, regard you know, not just with technology, but when you're starting to learn something new, you're always comparing it or contrasting it with something you're familiar with, you know, whether it's technology or cooking or, you know, whatever, whatever it is that you're, you're doing, you, you need, you, you're always looking at it through the lens of something you're familiar with. And when I was starting with Quarkus, everything that I learned and everything I did, you know, when I picked up JaxRS and JPA and all that, you know, the, the micro profile stuff, it was, how does, how does that fit into things that I know? How is it better? How does it make my life easier? But at the end of the day, it's how does it compare with things that I know? And so we decided to, to actually write a book about it because when you start looking at Quarkus, there's tons of guides out there and the guides are really, really good. But the, the guides really focus kind of on one thing like building a RESTful service or using Hibernate or Panache or whatever. And sometimes it's a, it's a little bit different than what a Spring developer might be familiar with. So we, we wanted to kind of level set and take a look at, well, people who are familiar with some of these concepts, the conventions, the auto configuration, all that kind of stuff, how does that work and what does that look like in Quarkus and what does Quarkus do similar and what does Quarkus do do different? And so we tried to do it through code examples by looking at, you know, why did we decide to do Quarkus in the first place, right? What was the problem that Quarkus was trying to solve that that's out there? You know, we didn't just decide or not, I keep saying we, I wasn't part of the, the Quarkus team, but they didn't just decide, hey, we need a new Java framework out there just, you know, because that there's a, there's a reason for it. So why? And then once you, you kind of get some foundation, and for me, I kind of like history a little bit. So some of the historical aspects of, what was going on, what were the challenges, and, and, and why this we, we needed this kind of thing. So after that, we took a look at how, to, how do you get started? You know, I'm familiar, if I'm a Spring developer, I'm familiar with the initializer, I'm familiar with all the, um, the starters and whatnot and what they do. What does that look like in Quarkus? How do I actually get started building something? And then from there, we take it into, okay, REST is pretty common out there. You know, there, we, there's a lot of RESTful applications. So looking at like Spring MVC, Spring Web Flux, and how does that translate into something in Quarkus? And then extending that, we use this kind of the same example that we started building at the beginning and each chapter kind of adds onto it. And, and we added persistence. So looking at both, you know, Spring Data JPA and Quarkus has this thing called Panache that is kind of like a, an abstraction, or not kind of, it, it is an abstraction on top of JPA, just like Spring Data JPA is. And so you, you'll find some of the patterns are, are very, very similar. <coughs> Excuse me. And then looking at event-driven services. So things like 
um, in memory trend, in memory um, data buses or Kafka events, you know, producers, consumers, K native, you know, how would I deploy my services into something like K native? And then once you have your application, how do you operate it? You know, what does it look like? What are the tools available? And when you start looking at containers, Kubernetes, you know, de deploying and running on, on the cloud, what are some of the differences or challenges with, with either one? And we tried to show that through example. And now I have to give some credit as well to Daniel O and Charles Mouillard. They, they helped co-author some of these chapters. So chapter five, the event-driven chapter was authored by Daniel O and chapter six by Charles Mouillard. They, they were fantastic to work with and, and very, very good. And we actually got somebody um, from Microsoft to, to write the forward. So Martin Verberg um, wrote the forward. And what was kind of interesting, um, something that he said in the forward, which, which kind of struck with me, I'll make this a little bit bigger so folks can see. What he kind of said is, you know, it's kind of that time in your in your career if you're if you are a spring developer you know i know for me personally when corcus first came out it was like why would i want to do this you know i'm familiar i'm good you know i've got my head down i'm good with what i've got but it's kind of like well there's kind of this new way of doing things you know this build time optimization thing it's kind of one of those points in your career where even if you don't adopt it, you should at least, you know, stick your head up out of the weeds and kind of take a scan about what, what's going on out there in the industry um, and, and explore, some, you know, something new in depth. And the, the book, I, I feel, makes it easy to do that. And, you know, obviously Martin feels the, the same way. Otherwise, he wouldn't have written it. Uh, so I don't want to spend a huge amount of time, you know, looking through the book and the chapters and whatnot. I want to dive into some some code. But as you can see, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty um, in-depth about, you know, some of, some of the concepts. Well, and one thing I tried to focus on me personally, I I'm a very big fan of test driven development. And so, you know, I, you know, write tests for, for pretty much everything. You know, there's, there's folks out there who might say, Oh, there's a, you know, there's some limit that you can reach where, you know, you're putting more effort into writing a test than the benefit you're getting. And, and I agree with that, but you, you need to have a, a good test suite. Right. And a lot of the, you know, whether you're spring Quarkus, whatever, a lot of the, things that you find out there in the internet or stack overflow or whatever are, you know, how do you solve a problem, but then how do I test what I built? And so look, within each chapter, you know, we'll spend half the chapter talking about how to build something. And then the second half of the chapter is, okay, now that you build that thing, how do you test that thing? So we, we focus a lot on, on testing. Uh, let's see here. So all the examples, for the, you know, there's, there's a whole set of example code that's out there. Um, there's a GitHub repo, and I'm gonna, you know, drop into my IDE in, in a second here. But there's a whole GitHub repo. It's it's organized by chapter. So you know, for example, we're gonna look at some of the persistent stuff today. So the chapter's organized. You know, there's a bunch of different examples. And it when I built the examples, I tried to follow a pattern that that they're to, to keep the both the Quarkus and the Spring examples as similar as possible. So to keep the code, and that that was kind of one of the focuses on this was to keep to keep the examples as close as possible, even might be a better way to do something, but from an understanding perspective, I, I want the examples to be as, as close an implementation as possible. And throughout chapter four, that's pretty much the case. But once you start getting into like the event driven stuff and the cloud stuff that it, it tends and you know, I don't know if you can see my hands, but it tends to to branch off and, it, and diverge quite a bit from, from an implementation perspective, but at least they all implement the same use case. So that that's helpful. So even in the event driven scenario, we, we implement the, the exact same use case, but the implementation is is quite quite different, just because the technology is different under the covers. Um, as far as versioning, the you know it was just like a writing a book, you know, with technology. The day it's published, it's it's out of date. So you know, once once you print something in these, these days, so keeping up was was tricky. Um, the book, the examples in the book were published, I think, with Quarkus two point one point four. So it was published at the end of August. Um, I just recently yesterday, uh, Quarkus 2.3 came out. So all the examples are up to date with the latest versions of everything. And I'm going to keep doing that as long as I don't have to make code changes that would involve, you know, kind of republishing the book kind of thing. Um, but that the spring uh, examples in the book are 2.5.4, I think. And it's been updated, the, the repo to 2.5.5. So they're, the repo is current with whatever the, the latest versions are at this point in time. Um, and I'm also trying to make notes. So at the main, in the main readme, you know, I kind of mentioned the the versions as well. But then, you know, as new things come out that I didn't necessarily implement 
in the examples because it would have made me change the text. Uh, but I did kind of comment on, you know, what might have, as new things have come out, what I might have done differently in the examples. And if we, you know, we do a new, you know, V2 of the book or a re-release, you know, in a few months, we may incorporate some of the stuff into it. But I, you know, I didn't want to change the the code in the in the repo if, so that it, I want to keep it so that it matches what's actually in the book because I think that would be super confusing to folks. All right, do we have any questions? It's in on the text. So otherwise, I'm going to drop into the IDE. Not yet. No questions so far, so please go ahead with the code. All right, so let's see it. So I've got an IDE. I've got my IDE here. I've got the examples repo loaded up. Um, what I'm going to look at today is I'm going to go into chapter four, and I'm going to look at, you know, one of the more common things is, you know, I need to build a REST layer and I need to talk to a database. It, it's a pretty pretty common, you know, architecture right now. And just so I'm, what I'm going to do is show a, a Spring Data JPA example alongside a what, what Corcus calls Panache, which is its uh, abstraction that sits on top of JPA and Hibernate. Under the covers, both use, you know, Hibernate is the most common um, ORM tool or ORM engine out there in, in the community. So they, they both sit on top of Hibernate um, as the JPA abstraction. Um, and as you'll start to see, and I've got some code, on, I'll explain the code in a second, that's it's pretty pretty similar. So if you're familiar with Spring, you know picking up Corcus or you know I like to say Corcus is based on a on a breadth of standards. So like JAXRS, JPA, whatnot. There's not a lot of Corcus to to get in your way. Most of the, the Corcus stuff happens at at build time is where the the Corcus magic happens. So on the left here, and I'm just gonna minimize that part just to give me some more screen real estate. On the left side. I've got the Corcus, and on the right side, I've got Spring Data JPA. And as you can see, I can make this a little smaller. Yeah, you know, most you know, at any entity class, this is a, an entity class. All the the kind of magic of an entity class is is up at the top. I I'm not using something like Lombok. You know that we can have a whole separate conversation about why not. But I I'm not using Lombok. So you know, under the constructors, there's a whole bunch of you know boilerplate getters and setters, two string hash code equals all that kind of stuff. So you, you don't need to see that. Um, but as you can see, and even if I open the imports here, these classes, if I, if you were to do a diff on them, they're exactly the same. There, there is no difference between these two classes. I, they, you could copy paste one to the other and it, it would just work because they are the same class. Those who are familiar with Spring Data JPA would be familiar with this, this repository thing. So in Spring, you build a repository extending, you know, there's a whole different flavor of base interfaces that you can extend. I chose for whatever reason, um, this one, the JPA repository, there's a CRUD repository, there's a sorting one, there's, there's a bunch of them. Um, and then I added an additional method to it to find something by name and it returns an optional whether it was found or not. And on the left side, you've got this, um, this Quarkus or Panache class. So the first thing you'll notice is it, it's a class instead of an interface. So the, the reason behind that is Spring Data JPA at runtime, when you start up your application, will scan for all of these interfaces and it'll build dynamic proxy implementations for them. So there's, there's a bunch of different ways you can build them. You can build your own classes and wire them together so that Spring Data understands where they are. Um, but at the end of the day, Spring Data is going to build a, an implementation of the interface and implement all your methods for you, and it does that at runtime. Whereas with Quarkus, all the, you know, kind of one of the main benefits of Quarkus is it optimizes stuff, and I'm just you know in air quotes here, stuff on the JVM. So part of that is well, rather than build an interface, I can actually build a class, and I still have this plethora of base implementations that I can pick from. I just picked you know the the basic one that kind of looks similar to JPA repository, but it provides a whole bunch of, you know, CRUD based methods for me, like create, you know, pretty much all the same stuff you'd find in, in the spring version. And again, I implemented the same find by name, but I actually implemented the, the method. So you notice I'm, you know, returning, I'm finding something and I'm querying by name and, you know, returning some optional, you know, Spring Data JPA has a way where I can annotate my methods with like at query, I can do name queries and I can do all the same stuff 
with with panache and it's it looks pretty much exactly the same you know my my use cases here are pretty pretty simple um, and then the only other thing is the annotation so by default corcus uses cdi as its dependency injection framework so because i built an interface i need to tell the dependency injection container that this is a bean that needs to be uh, inject injectable within the context but what's kind of interesting with Quarkus is all this bean injection stuff happens at build time, not at runtime. So like all the, and maybe to make more sense if I actually go to you know, where the class is used. So in Spring MVC, you build a controller class and in uh, Jax, and in Quarkus uses JaxRS. So you build resource classes, right? That's just a different naming convention. Um, but all this, you see the, it's, I'm using constructor injection. That should probably be familiar to Spring folks because I know the Spring team themselves recommends um, constructor injection over like auto-wired fields. When I was committing stuff, you know, a few years ago, if a pull request didn't do it that way, if you did, you know, the, the other way, they would actually deny it and you'd have to go fix it. So they, they certainly prefer constructor injection. There's a whole slew of reasons why I personally feel it's better anyway than, than field level injection, which... You know, if you want to have me back, we can have that conversation too. Um, but in any case, they're they're exactly the, the the way the beans are injected is done exactly the same. But back to my previous point about build time versus runtime in Quarkus, this binding in the the byte code for for binding a bean injection point, which is done by type, just like in Spring, is actually done at build time. So the Quarkus build process will will generate all the byte code and kind of pre-warm the just-in-time uh, compiler so that when the Quarkus application starts, all that binding and injection, you know, there's no proxies or anything. It's just, the, you know, the real thing is just kind of there. Whereas in Spring, all that stuff is kind of done at runtime. But you can see if you're not familiar with JaxRS, it, it's it's very, very similar. So, you, you know, you annotate your class with kind of a base path, just kind of like in Spring, you do a request mapping and then you just implement your your method so in spring all the the mapping annotations you know get mapping and put mapping and post mapping and all that kind of stuff has all the metadata as part of the annotation so like the media types and paths and and all that stuff whereas in in JaxRS, all those they're all separate annotations so you know you've got to get annotation a produces annotation a path annotation and what that's kind of interesting if you notice here you know, on the spring side, you know, I've got some validation stuff, which I have over on the Quarkus side as well from the val bean validation spec. Um, and then all the imports are, you know, the spring, the typical spring MVC imports. But on the Quarkus side, there's nothing Quarkus E. I like to say Quarkus E here. It's all built on standard. So JaxRS, I'm using, you know, standard JaxRS out of the box. Under the covers, though, Quarkus is built on a reactive engine. It uses Netty, which is the same engine that is under Spring Webflux. And, and in this case, in this example, this is Tomcat behind it. But the fact that Quarkus is reactive doesn't mean you have to build your application reactive. Quarkus will kind of understand what's going on. So in this case, all my method, I'm not doing anything reactive here. I'm not using any reactive types. I'm using you know standard GDBC stuff. Quarkus will just kind of figure out that Hey, this method needs to be moved off uh, off of the I/O thread onto a worker thread. Whereas in in the Spring example, everything is done you know with the thread per request model. So every request that comes in is on it, it's on its own thread, so that the developer doesn't really have to worry about that. So other than that, I mean the you know the implementations, you know, the, the actual code like in the methods is is pretty similar. I mean, you know. Spring has this response entity. Quarkus has a response object. You know, if I want to change the status code on the response or anything like that, transactional. You know, doing transactions. You know, it, it's very similar. Except the the Spring one uses the the Spring annotation for transactional, whereas the Quarkus one uses the the JTA transactional annotation. So it's kind of cool if we if we run this. So in Quarkus, one thing that I can do. You know, I'm going to use Maven here. Is I have this thing called dev mode. Now you remember, I the only thing I didn't show was configuration in, in Quarkus. I don't think there is any, but when I run the Quarkus application, or I can run it in what's called dev mode. Quarkus sees, hey, I have a Postgres driver here, but you didn't configure a data source. 
So what Corcus will do is it'll actually bootstrap a Postgres container for me and it'll bind my application to the container. And you have to forgive my machine. The fans are spinning so fast. I feel like the laptop's going to lift off into outer space. So, yep, so you can see Docker is, I'm running Docker desktop, but if I was using Podman, it would work just the same. Um, you know, the data source is starting. It's pulling a, a database. And I actually custom built a, a database image for this exercise just to kind of pre-populate a schema and preload data into it so that all the examples are, are based off of the exact same schema. So there's no change in the in the schema here. And so while that starts up, you see yep, the dev, this thing called dev services started. So it started database and now my application is up and I can start, you know, interacting with it. And if I just do like PIE8080. Okay, man. There we go. We got some some JSON back, All right? So, you know that that's pretty cool. But what what if we kind of start to to compare and contrast what's going on? If I go over to the Spring one, so the first thing I need to do is I need to start a database, right? So I need to where was my database? I need to start my database. I'm going to start the, the image manually. And while that goes, oops, into the right place. And then I'm going to do, I already built the application. So I'm going to say Java dash D spring dot data source that URL and JD. DBC, Postgres, localhost, 5432, roots, and target. Name of my app here. Let me gonna get the name of my app. Where is my binary? I don't know why my auto completion isn't working. Um, dash jar. There we go. So my application starting up. Still going. And it's up, right? So now if I go and I, you know, I do the same, same thing. And I get it back. But what's kind of cool, if I want to actually look at the process, so I have a little script that will calculate the resident set size. So RSS is the, the memory footprint of the application, not just the heap size, but all the off heap stuff as well. So if I take a look at that, I could see my application is using 434 megs of, of RSS space. So now if I kill my application, my database is still up. And if I you know do this kind of the same thing, on the, the Quarkus one. It's up. And you notice it started in like four seconds. What did the spring one start in? It's going by log 11 seconds. So 11 seconds for spring, four seconds for Quarkus. You know, if I do the same HTTP request, just a foot funnel request through, and then you know, look at the RSS. That I'm using 184 megs. Same application, same use case, same implementation, and you know what? I don't know what the percentages are in my head, but 434 versus 184, and you know I started up in a third of the amount of time. The other thing I know we're kind of running out of time here, but I, I also do so. Corcus makes it really easy to do this native image stuff, so I could also do. I already built the native image. I'm just gonna find the command here. I export the data source and then I run my native image. I started in, where's my start time? <clears throat> 221 milliseconds. And if I funnel the same request through it, back and if I, then if I do my RSS, uh, 32 meg, 33 megs. 
same application. <clears throat> so you can kind of see some of some of the differences here. So now what, what do we have five minutes left, Edson? Do we need to pause for questions? Uh, we do have some questions. Actually, people are starting to fire the chat right now. But let's start with uh, the first. So let me get it for you. So I was able to type this one. Like Raja is asking, uh, do you recommend giving up Spring for new products? Uh, probably talking about Quarkus. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, it's it's an interesting. So it comes back to, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Obviously, I, I think Quarkus is a, is a good thing, um, especially for, um, you know, it, it's a good thing for Java. And I think uh, VMware and Spring have, have realized this. I mean, Quarkus wasn't the first to, or, you know, about the same time Quarkus came out, you know, that Micronaut was doing something similar with, with this build time optimization stuff. So I know like at Spring 1, uh, they announced that Spring 6, which will be kind of the next kind of major release of Spring, and then Spring Boot 3 will follow that, is, is targeted for the end of next year. But <clears throat> part of their reasoning is that they want to re-architect and refactor the framework because kind of they see that this kind of build time and ahead of time optimization for Java is is a good thing. And, and that's where, where industry is going. So I would say, you know, if you're familiar with Spring, as much as I'd love to say, yeah, give it up and, and don't do it, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I, Spring is certainly powerful. I'm still like it. it it's a very, it, not that Quark, I don't want to say Quarkus is immature, but Spring is a very mature framework. It's been around for a really long time. But part of, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Part of being around for a very long time makes it so that it's going to be really hard for them to re-architect and fit. I mean, the whole if you understand kind of how spring works under the covers, it, it's based on a lot of the AOP and dynamic proxying and runtime stuff that when you start looking at this build time, you know, doing stuff at build time kind of goes contrary to that architecture. So, and then having to retrofit that without breaking everything and su still supporting everything that's already there is, it's going to be tough. I mean, I'm sure they're, they're going to do it and they'll, they'll do a good job of it, but um it's a lot of work. It's going to be a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Now we have a lot of questions just because <laughs> started with the first and one. I can, I can go past the half hour if we need to. So. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, let's try to read the first. And Asif is asking, uh, will, you dis will you discuss this uh, DB custom image and Quarkus integration? Uh, I don't know if I got the question. Uh, yeah, I mean, the custom image I built was just, you know, I took a Postgres, the standard Docker Hub. Yep, sorry. I took That's the, why you know it's live. Yeah, Yeah. now you know you're really live when the phone rings or the dog barks or something like that. So the, um, yeah, I lost my translation. Oh, the DB image. So the all it was was I took the standard Postgres 13 image and I added a init script that creates the schema and then a SQL file that inserts data into it. Just, just to make it easy, because what I wanted to show and what I didn't show here was, you know, the having your application create the database for you when it starts up, populate the scheme and whatnot is is great for local development. But what it doesn't test is if you're building a JPA entity class and you've got these different annotations. Most of the time, your app is connecting to a database that already exists, and so how do you test what your your application if if you can actually bind to that schema, right? And so a better way I feel of doing that, and I'll just show in, in here in, in YAML, is rather than telling Hibernate to generate the schema, tell it to actually do a validation. So if you're running against a container image that already has a schema, let it let your when your tests start up or when your application starts up, validate that the annotations that you wrote on your entity class actually generate the proper DDL to match the schema you're trying to connect to. And that that's what I did for all these examples. So that's why I built a custom image. Just for that. Cool. And let's see. Shane is asking, how do <coughs> principles like user credentials, sessions, and other stuff differ between Quarkus and Spring? I'm interested in Quark's, Quark sizing a Spring project, but I but didn't know if it's a lot of work or not for this part. So what do you think? Um, so in sessions, are they talking about, I assume, HTTP sessions? So Forgetting about the technology choice under the covers, you know, when you start talking about distributed applications, like I'm going to deploy in or instances of the same app, 
you know, the whole, the HTTP session thing where you're, you're putting something in the session and storing it per session maybe isn't the best way of doing things in a, in a microservices world because in microservices, you want some kind of backing service. So if I wanted to do that, why not just store it in something like InfiniSpan or Redis or, or whatever, right? So to me, that would be a better, whether you're doing Corcus or Spring, that's probably a better approach for, for microservices. Um, that being said, like I said, the, the underlying engine for, for Corcus is, is uh, the reactive Netty and Corcus sits on top of uh, Eclipse Vertex. So if you're familiar with Vertex, Vertex is a very slim, lightweight and high performant reactive frame, framework. And so Corcus sits on top of that. And so under the covers, the reactive engine um, handles, handles a lot of that stuff for you. But it, it's kind of abstracted away from, from the developer a little bit. I don't think oh, that completely uh, answers the question, but mm -hmm. yeah, understand. And uh, John is John Klinger is asking why didn't the book cover the Quarkus, Quarkus Spring compatibility APIs? I'm gonna give him give him hell afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it so the book talks about so there are these Spring compatibility APIs where you can take a, a Spring application and you can minimal invasiveness run, I don't want to say run it on Quarkus, but change it into a Quarkus application. And we have, and I can I can go back to the, the browser and show you there's a workshop that, that or a self-paced tutorial that'll take, take you about 45 minutes if you're interested in it, that, you know, kind of take Quarkus, look at this, like the Spring MVC, Spring Data JPA annotations and whatnot, and kind of do it, put an adapter layer at build time on top of it so that you don't necessarily have to change your code. And those are, those are good for, for getting started, but I, I don't think the, and you know, again, I'm not part of the Quarkus team, so I can't speak for them, but I don't think the intent there is to kind of start off and build fresh or new applications that way. They're meant for, hey, I want to get started with it, or I've got some applications that don't use a lot of like in-depth spring things. So things like if I'm doing like really complicated exception mapping or as an example, you're going to run into edge cases really fast, so it's good to to kind of play around and learn about Corcus. But if you're going to start fresh, I would I would start fresh. And, and the book has a, like a a section in chapter two that that kind of says the same thing that I just said. But the the focus of the book was looking at Spring and looking at Corcus and kind of kind of merging them together. Another question here from Oro: How do you solve hypermedia? Any equivalent of HeyOS? I believe Quarkus does have it. I personally haven't played with it, but I believe uh, I can go out to. Um, I mean, I can. I don't know. If I can take that offline and, and look. I believe there is an extension for something. I I can't speak personally to it because I haven't done it. Okay. Cool. Uh, okay. Uh, this is a cool one. Matthew is asking for Spring Boot. It's possible to generate Swagger documentation for your API. Is this as easy for Quark or for Quarkus? So let, let's put a caveat there. The generation of the Swagger stuff isn't part of Spring Boot, right? Spring doesn't have that. You've got to use something like Spring Doc or what's the other one? Spring Fox. There's, there's a few open source projects out there, but it's not part of of uh, Spring. In um, chapter two or chapter three, I actually talk about that, and I showed Cor uh, Quarkus does have an extension that's just built into the framework that can do that. And you know, I could take my resource classes and annotate them or generate open API stuff. Just and it looks looks the same, but but yes. Oh yeah, if you add the open API extension, yes, generates it for you. And yep. in dev mode, you have the Swagger UI added for you automatically as well. Yep, and that's super cool. And uh, uh, Dominic is asking, uh, any Spring feature you miss uh, uh, f uh, with, uh, as you have like a Quarkus equivalent for? Any Spring features I miss that there isn't a feature for? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I haven't come across anything yet. I mean, I know what, so when I, and I didn't show it in the demo, but when you start getting into like reactive or event driven, um, Quarkus, it's just kind of built in with like the reactive stuff, um, the, the micro profile reactive extensions and the spring 
I don't want to say the spring version of the spring answer to that is, but the, the way you would do that in spring is what, with spring cloud stream or spring integration and whatnot. And what, one thing I found that actually wasn't there in spring or that maybe I just didn't know how to do it. I mean, I banged my head against the desk for hours before I just wrote something myself is a way to do think about a use case where I have an app that's listening to messages from Kafka or, you know, mess, some kind of message broker it doesn't have to be Kafka and that I want to serve those as service end events. So, you know, listening and then publishing and having to like store the stream and wait for subscribers to subscribe to the stream because you don't want to just buffer those in memory because you, you, know, you can run out of memory real fast if you get a lot of events. I could not find anything in Spring Cloud Stream or Spring Integration to do that. I had to kind of drop down to Project Reactor uh, has this concept of a sync that that manages subscriptions and whatnot. Whereas Quarkus, it's just, it was just built into the event bus. Like Quark, it's just there. It's part of, you know, Vertex, it, part of the underlying Vertex framework. Hmm. Yeah, from yeah, if I yeah, the only thing that I think that Quarkus didn't have, like uh, when I needed to talk to two separate databases, the first versions of Quarkus you couldn't do that, uh, yep. but now I think it's solved. So uh, for my project at least, yep. uh, I can do everything. And but one thing that I really miss in Spring when I have to touch my Spring project is the dev mode. So once you touch Quarkus dev mode, you're absolutely spoiled. And then dev services. So like you need a database or a Kafka broker or Redis or a schema registry or HashiCorp Vault or any of these other types of services that you need to run locally. You know, now you don't need to set up like a Docker Compose or anything like that. Quarkus dev mode will just spin it up for you automatically. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, let me see. Um, yeah, let me try. Oh, lots of questions. It's even hard to shoot to read it. Um, <laughs> Alfred is asking, what is the future for native images? Are there any new features coming? New features for native images? Um, I know, and this isn't specific to Quarkus, but I know there's the new flight recorder, Java flight recorder for GraalVM that was contributed. I, I don't know exactly what version, but that that's kind of new. And that's just a, you know across the spectrum for anything using GraalVM. Um, I'm not in the Graal VM space, so I don't really track it as, as much. I just know I do, you know, Maven package dash P native, it works. And then I, I get a native image, or if I want to do it in a container, I can do a container build and make a native image and it's worked for the last two years. Right. So I, I, don't, I don't really have anything else to add to that. Okay. Uh, Jan Milton is asking, does unit test change when using Quarkus? Yeah, so I, I think I ran out of time and I wanted to show this. Uh, I don't know if you have a second. You can go back to my my screen share here, my IDE. I, I wanted to to show kind of some of the tests. And yes, yeah, Spring has its own testing framework for you know testing different layers of your your application, right? So testing a resource versus testing uh, like a controller class here. It, it's the pattern is the same. So like in this case where I'm doing, um, do I have the right tests? Oh no, that's the repository. Here we go. So like Spring MVC uses this mock MVC thing to do tests or you know you could start it up and do like test rest template or something. So Spring WebFlux, now you bring, if you're, if you're doing reactive, so kind of the, one of the cool things with Quarkus is, Quarkus doesn't care if you're doing reactive or not and you don't have to do something special to do reactive or not. Spring, you kind of need to make that decision before you've written a line of code. Am I doing reactive? Am I doing blocking? Because once you make that choice, you're kind of stuck with it unless you want to rewrite your application. And so that even falls through when you start doing testing. So like the way you write your tests in for Spring MVC is different than the way you write your tests using a WebFlux-based controller, whereas with Quarkus, it doesn't really matter. Um, the, the test is written exactly the same. But the the kind of algorithm of how you do testing is the same. You know, you take your, in this case, the resource or controller layer the, that has a dependency on your repository layer. You stub out or mock the repository layer. That way you can test your kind of your resource layer or whatever layer you're trying to test in isolation. So, you know, the, the pattern is do your mocking. And in this case, they both use Makito. They both use JUnit 5. Um, the mocking is almost exactly the same. Like, I think it is exactly the same. What, what's different is the kind of the expectations and the framework inside. So, you know, with mock MVC, you do it this way. With mm -hmm. with uh, WebFlux, you do it another way. But in Quarkus, Quarkus uses um, Rest Assured for its its um, testing RESTful layers. Um, you could use Rest Assured with Spring as well. I, I personally never have, but you could. Um, 
but even testing like your repository layer now, like I want to do like test that the operation that I, that custom operation I wrote so I can stub out and I can have in both cases have spring or Quarkus, you know, run each test in an isolated transaction so that it rolls back the, the database after the, the test is completed. But you can see, I mean, it's very, they both use a cert J. I mean, if you love a cert J like I do, you use it in either. So the, it, it's very, very similar. Okay, uh, Andres is asking, what is Gra what is the Grau VM role in Quarkus and how uh, is it important? <clears throat> yeah, so so, so this is my personal opinion here. I think, you know, a couple of years ago, if you were to say the word Kafka, it was kind of like this shiny ball that was traveling through space that everybody was trying to, to catch to say, oh, I need to do Kafka, I need to do Kafka, even if it wasn't the right fit for their use case. I think native image in Graal VM is a similar thing right now. It's like everybody's got this native image and I'm trying to move my hand to the camera here. Native image up here on this pedestal and everybody's like trying to change, oh, I need to do native image. I need to do native image without thinking about, well, what are the, the good things about it? What are the things that you really need to think about before you go down that path and what use cases is it really good for? So to, to answer the question, Graal VM is a a virtual machine that's out there that can take your compiled bytecode and actually translate it into a native machine binary like Linux or Mac or Windows or whatever. But during that process, it does like a tremendous amount of aggressive dead code elimination. So not just in your application, but if you took, if you formed a dependency graph of all the dependencies your application depends on, and then you opened up all those jars and you took all those classes out and you threw them in a directory, Graal VM would go through all of that and look to see, is there a static binding at build time where a you know, path can flow from one method in one class to another method in another class? And anything that didn't have a path, it just threw away and got rid of. And once it was done, it would form this, this binary. And that's what makes it super small and super fast to start up because there's not a whole lot of, you know, in air quotes here stuff that, that's in it. That being said, there are drawbacks to that. Like think about monitoring. You know, if you're do, using agent-based monitoring, like you attach an agent to your JVM, like like a Dynatrace type thing, that's not going to work in native image because there's no JVM, right? It's just, you know, like running any other native binary on, on the machine. So you, you've got to figure out what your, what your monitoring story is going to be. Um, it's really good for short living processes. So think about serverless, like running Lambda functions or Azure functions or whatever, pick cloud provider of choice or, you know, an open shift or whatever. Um, being able to quickly start these things up, have them do some work, live for a while and go away. But historically, like the, the Java runtime, and especially the, the just-in-time compiler is really, really good about watching your application over time and optimizing it based on what kind of what's going on in the JVM and you don't get that in Graal VM. So if your process is like really memory intensive and really long running, not saying it won't work, but you know, the JVM might over time outperform the, the native image. Cool. Yeah. We're already on top of the hour. So last question, uh, Vinicius is asking, how about the exception handling layer with Quarkus? Do we have a base class similar to the response entity exception handler in Spring to treat the runtime exceptions? Yeah, so there's a few different ways to do it. Me, when I've done like exception handling, um, yeah, you can always throw th those exceptions. I actually wrote an article on DZone a while back um, about exception handling in general because you know there's, there's always compile time versus runtime. You know check exceptions are good, check exceptions are bad, runtime exceptions are good, runtime exceptions are bad, but we can have that conversation another time if you want. But essentially with Spring, you can do it a few different ways. You can do like exception handlers, you can throw, you know, the I think it's response status exception, you know, where you can customize the, the point. Um, Quarkus sitting on top of JaxRS has all that same stuff. So if you look in the JaxRS spec, there are different, there's like a generic, I think it's web application exception in a you know, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I could be the wrong names, but there's a, a base level exception that's like something bad happened and you can customize the thing. But there's also like smaller, I don't want to say smaller, but like sub exception types for specific use cases that you can throw. Um, or you can, like I did in my response class, you can you know, throw a you know, return a response object that has whatever you want, which is similar to the response entity class in Spring. Mm-hmm. 
Cool. Well, Eric, I'd like to thank you for this amazing talk and congratulate you for again one more time for the book because it's a, it's a great content and you can tell that the audience was super interested because we had a lot of questions and comments so thank you very much and if you have anything else to present uh, please uh, reach out to me and we can schedule something new uh, for you yeah and if you i don't think you have my twitter handle i'm not a huge tweet person but you know if anybody has questions that they didn't get answered and want to reach out through twitter or whatnot happy to start a conversation there. I think it's just at ED Andrea. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, thank you very much and uh, hope to see you soon in our next divination offering. Bye. Bye everyone.